energized, excited, and uh, One thing that, that he left out is that, so Eric, does everybody know Eric? Uh, he's responsible for putting this program together. He and I were classmates uh, back in 2010 at Singularity University, uh, back when they ran a 10 week long innovation program. So Eric and I uh, go way back and we've seen each other in all sorts of funny situations. Um, so it's a pleasure to be speaking in front of you today. Um, so, thank you for joining me. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the Internet of Things, um, but I want to start off by talking a little bit about exponential technologies, uh, which you've all heard a little bit about this morning. Um, so this is, is Moore's Law, uh, right, and, and you're probably sick of hearing about it by now, um, but, you know, at a high level, it states that we went in the 1970s from thousands of microprocessors on a circuit to now billions of microprocessors on a circuit. And it's this transformation that has been responsible for a lot of disruption, not only within the computing industry, but within any industry that relies upon computing. One example of that is genome sequencing. When the genome was first sequenced, it cost $100 million to sequence the human genome. Uh, now, we've seen that cost drop to below $1,000. Uh, and this is astounding, right? This, this kind of exponential growth that we've seen. And so many of you might be thinking, you know, why is it then that I still face all the problems that I face in my business today? Why is it that we, you know, in the world face all of these fundamental challenges that still seem to be very intractable? Uh, and that is because there is some bad news. And the bad news is that most of the world does not move at an exponential rate. So this is a chart which shows the growth in fuel economy efficiency over that same period of time as Moore's Law. And you can see that we've nearly doubled fuel efficiency, but that's nowhere near the one millionfold increase that we saw thanks to Moore's Law. And to put that in perspective, if our cars were getting more fuel efficient at the same rate that computers were getting faster, then one tablespoon of gasoline would be enough power to go around the world two times. So there's a big gap here, right? Um, and this is a big gap that any of you who are not in the software business probably see. You hear about all these sexy technologies that are coming out of companies like Google and Amazon, and you wonder, you know, how is it that I'm not seeing the benefits of that? And the answer, frankly, is that in order to take advantage of exponential technologies that are coming from the digital realm, you need to make the physical digital. And that is exactly what Internet of Things is all about. So this is a chart showing the rise of Internet of Things. And I think that there are two important things to take away from this chart. So the first is the sheer speed of that growth, right? Back in you know, the early 90s, we have a million people connected to the Internet. Now we have 25 billion connected devices. And in the next five years, we're going to have over 50 billion. The second important thing to take away from this chart is the kinds of things that are being connected because we don't have 25 billion people on Earth. So what's happened? Well, what's happened is that the things that we've connected have ceased to be what we traditionally think of as computers, but are other things, things like wind turbines and light bulbs. And what this means is that the Internet of Things is fundamentally transforming what it means to be a computing device. The form factor of a computer is changing profoundly. And this is happening through three exponential technologies. The first technology is sensors. So this is a picture of the world's first digital camera uh, invented at Kodak. It was a 0.01 megapixel camera. Uh, subjects had to sit still for 20 seconds to have It could only film in black and white, and it cost millions of dollars to cobble together. This is what a digital camera looks like today. So this camera is capable of filming one million times higher quality and costs one millionth of the price. So what happened? How is it that we went from you know, this Kodak camera, which clearly belongs in a museum, uh, to you know, something that can fit on the tip of our fingertip and perform that much better? What happened is that we got very, very good at making things very, very small. This is a chart showing just how good we've gotten. So what you can see here is an exponential decrease in the size of mechanical devices 
that we've been manufacturing. And it's important to remember that Moore's Law, right, that, that exponential trend that is powering all of these other trends, Moore's Law is fundamentally about making things smaller. It's about making transistors smaller. Because when you make them smaller, you can put them closer together, and then you can have more in a single place, you reduce the energy consumption, you increase the speed. So we've gotten very, very good at making things very, very small. So good that in order to see many of the sensors that we use today, you need to look at them under a microscope. So this is an example of an accelerometer sensor. Uh, this is something that all of you have in your cell phones, that you have in your cars, they're absolutely ubiquitous. Uh, and to give you a perspective of just how small these are, this is a dust mite <coughs> next to that accelerometer. And the new generation of sensors that are being developed are at the nanoscale. So this is at the micro scale. The nanoscale would mean that you could fit that entire device onto the tip of a hair on that dust mite. The cost of these sensors is decreasing significantly. Over the past 10 years, we've seen a 70% reduction in the cost of NEM sensors. And during that, that period, we're also seeing a growth in the number of sensors being deployed. So 2012, we had 5 billion new sensors deployed. Five years later, it's 50 billion. Five years after that, we're predicting 500 billion sensors being deployed every year. So it's not just the, the fact that sensors have gotten cheaper and smaller and more. We're also developing new kinds of sensors that didn't exist before. So this is an example of LiDAR. And LiDAR is a sensing technology that's really at the core of the autonomous car movement. And what LiDAR does is it uses a laser which it projects onto objects. And that laser bounces off of those objects and hits a sensor and it can detect very, very precisely the distance between this car and those objects. This is a technology that has decreased in cost by over 600 fold in the past 10 years. And that's thanks to companies like GM and Google investing billions of dollars in LiDAR technology. And so, so why is it so important? It's important because if you're driving down the road at 60 miles an hour and you see something, you need to know, is that a plastic bag or is that a cat? And LiDAR is the technology that's going to enable you to make that difference in time. We're also seeing new forms of technology in the sensing, uh, in sensing that rely on biology to do the sensing. So this is some research that came out recently where they have engineered a sensor that's able to detect foodborne illnesses. So every year we have half a million people that die as a result of foodborne pathogens. This sensor has DNA within it, and that DNA will light up in the presence of things like salmonella and other foodborne pathogens. And you can think of using this sensor to replace what we have now, which is a Best Buy date, right? Which is a really crude way of trying to estimate you know, when this food is going to go off by, to being able to actually monitor in real time whether this food is safe. The next technology I want to talk about is networks. So networks have been getting bigger. Uh, and they've been getting bigger at an exponential rate. To put this in perspective, our old generation of internet protocol, IPv4, had two to the 32 different locations on it. And then last year, we introduced IPv6, which is the new internet protocol, and that has two to the 128. And these numbers probably don't mean that much, so let me put this into perspective. If you think of our old internet in terms of volume, and you think of every single internet address being a point in space, we could fit all of that within the size of a beach ball, okay? Now, with our new internet protocol, we are moving from an internet the size of a beach ball to internet the size of the sun. This is the increase in the space allocatable with this network standard, and that's because of the demand that we have from all these new connected devices. At the same time, we've seen that bandwidth has become 40 times cheaper, and that the speed has increased over 3,000 fold. And the consequence of, of these three trends is, of course, massive adoption of the internet, faster than any technology ever introduced in the history of mankind. This is a chart which shows between 2000 and 2010 the rate of internet adoption in the world. Back in 2000, less than 50% of American households had the internet. 
In 2010, more than half of the world had access to the internet. Where we are today, more people have access to the internet than have access to clean drinking water or reliable sources of electricity. And you know, this highlights two things, right? One, it highlights how fast the internet develops, but two, it highlights what I said at the beginning, which is that the physical world does not move exponentially. We still have a challenge, though, and that challenge is that while most of the world has some access to the internet, that access is not equal. Uh, and this becomes really important when you're doing something more than just making a phone call or more than just checking your email, and you want to actually use services that are dependent upon internet connectivity. And so, how do we overcome this challenge? It's a challenge that is going to be made even worse, potentially, when we move towards 5G networks, which rely on even more physical infrastructure to deploy internet connectivity. And the solution, or a solution, may be to move away from land-based infrastructure and start going up into space. So SpaceX recently announced that they plan to launch over 4,000 satellites in the next few years. And there's nothing new about satellite-based internet. That's important to remember. So 10 years ago, Boeing sent up a satellite to deliver satellite internet. Um, but it sucked. It was really, really bad in terms of latency. And the reason is that that satellite was 22,000 miles above the Earth. The satellites that SpaceX and other companies like NextWeb plan to send up are only going to be 800 miles above the Earth. And that reduction means that you have a far lower latency in your connectivity. The trade-off is that those satellites can only ever cover a really small area, and that's why you need so, so many of them. There's another challenge uh, in, in delivering connectivity. Um, and this challenge can be illustrated, I think, by looking at this diagram. So here you see up top you know, this 3,000-fold increase uh, in, in broadband speed, and you see you know, some of Moore's Law and the processor speed getting faster. But there's one number here that should stick out to you. Uh, anybody want to volunteer? A number that doesn't seem to match the others. The battery, right? Batteries yeah. still suck. Um, you know, they've only gotten in this time, we've got you know, 3,000 faster connectivity, but our batteries only increased by 20%. So what are we to do, right? Now, you know, there are exciting developments in making better batteries that are on the way, but I feel like every other week I read about a new university coming out with a new battery prototype, and yet my iPhone still sucks. So I was really, really excited to read about some research coming out of the University of Washington where they are moving away from batteries altogether. So here, you have a radio frequency receiver, but it's not receiving radio frequency in order to play those in you know, the form of radio, it's using that to power this kitchen monitor. So that tower that's five kilometers away is powering this kitchen monitor. And they've recently adapted this technology to create the world's first battery-free cell phone. Now, to be honest, I don't think that this is a technology we're going to see hitting the market in this form anytime soon. It's not nearly sexy enough for most people, but it's something that's going to be absolutely critical to being able to deploy more sensors in more places and not having to rely on switching batteries in and out all the time. So the consequence of having all of these sensors is that we are creating a tremendous amount of data. How much data? Well, <laughs> here's a chart. And in this chart, you can see in the blue all the data that we create through our human interactions. And in this other color, you can see how much data is going to be created through the Internet of Things. When I saw this chart, it basically meant nothing to me. And the reason is that I have no idea what a zeta byte is. Um, so I imagine many of you feel the same. So here's one way to think about that. 200 exabytes is enough to record all information ever written or spoken between human beings in human history. And so we will be producing five times that for one data byte. So you look at this and you say, okay, great, you're producing a tremendous amount of data. I already know that from the last talk, um, but you know, what good is that, right? And, and I think that that's an important and a critically important thing to recognize is that simply creating a bunch of data without being able to extract value from it is worthless. So people say, you know, your data is your gold. 
Uh, I spent some time working in the gold uh, and metal recovery industry, and to me, your data is much more like your gold ore, right? And the best quality gold ore in the world contains five parts per million gold in it. So that means that you have to go through a lot of waste and a lot of trash in order to get to that value. And I would argue that we are producing data at a rate where using humans to do that work is simply no longer feasible. And so this is where we call upon the third exponential technology, artificial intelligence. And you already had a great talk uh, about AI from Paul, um, but I'll just you know, cover off a few high-level points. So you know, I think that in order to understand AI, and especially to understand deep learning, it's important to start with a really, really hard problem. Uh, and this is our problem. Uh, we've got these pictures of cupcakes, and we've got these pictures of chihuahuas, and we need to be able to tell which is which. And, you know, you can think of the old way of approaching this by rules, right? You try to specify, okay, you know, uh, it's got three dots in it, and, you know, that's going to flag both pictures. Um, you can go through and try to figure out and write down, and you know, this could be a fun exercise, like what are the rules you would use to decide between them, and I guarantee you, you would have a tough time doing that. Not only that, but if I were to now throw in a third category, and I put in, you know, cranberry muffins, you would have to completely rewrite all of your rules. <clears throat> so this is a way to illustrate the difference between classical programming, where you start with a set of rules, and you input data, and then you get the answers with machine learning, right? And here, we are using the data and an algorithm to generate those rules. The rules are no longer an input, they are an output. And what makes this so interesting and important for Internet of Things is that what that means is that you can use the exact same algorithm that was used to identify chihuahuas and now, just because you have fed it different data, it's able to detect whatever it is that you want it to detect. 2012 was really when this got kicked off. And again, I would argue it's not because there was a new algorithm invented. It's because the amount of data that we have, we finally figured out a way to take advantage of it. You've heard a little bit about computer vision. This is referring to that challenge that Bob spoke about, ImageNet. Um, you know, 2011, 28% error rate. 2016, we no longer run this competition anymore. And this has some really amazing applications within medicine. So this is a project between Google and Cornell University. And what they did here is they pitted up a team of pathologists against a computer vision algorithm. And those pathologists were given as much time as they wanted to pick out where in this slide they saw cancerous cells. And that computer vision algorithm had no time at all. And they found that when they compared the results, that computer vision algorithm was able to beat those pathologists by 16%. That exact same algorithm is being used to monitor fishes, uh, fishing. So, you know, you heard again earlier about how, wild, uh, about how illegal fishing is a huge problem, right? One third of all fish caught are caught illegally. Well, this is a project that is using computer vision to go through video that's been filmed aboard a fishing vessel and identify what kind of fish have been caught. And that we think is going to enable us to actually deploy the kind of monitoring that needs to be deployed in order to combat illegal fishing. One challenge that exists, though, is that there's a limited number of people who possess the kind of talent you need to build these algorithms. And that's why a new trend is even more exciting, I would argue. And that's that we are now getting to a point where AI is able to build better AI. And I want to connect this back to Moore's Law. So in Moore's Law, you saw this huge growth in, in the speed of computing. And what was driving that was the fact that faster computers allowed you to build faster computers. We're now seeing the same thing in AI, where better AI is allowing us to build better AI. So these are really the three building blocks. <clears throat> you have sensors, you have networks, and you have machine learning. And you know, I would argue that any one of these on its own is pretty interesting, but it's really these three combined that is exponential. 
Uh, you know, you can have the best sensors in the world collecting all sorts of data, but if you don't have a way to transmit that data, it's useless. And even if you can transmit that data, if you're relying on a human being to analyze it, you will always be limited. On the other hand, you can have the best algorithms in the world, but if you're not getting new and better data, those algorithms are only ever going to be of limited use. So these are the three exponential technologies, the building blocks of Internet of Things. And I now want to talk about four trends that are being enabled. And the first trend, I need to understand, you have to go back to the, the first industrial revolution, right? So electricity is a technology that's existed for far longer than we've taken advantage of it. The first battery was invented in 1800. Edison was generating electricity at scale during the late 1800s. But it wasn't until the 1920s that most factories actually were using electricity at scale. And this is because there was a profound mind shift that took place during that time. And that mind shift was that what gets measured gets managed, right? This was a, a, a new idea in industrial engineering that we need to start measuring our output and measuring our productivity and building our factories to maximize that. And once that mindset caught on, then it became obvious that electricity was going to afford a higher level of productivity than alternatives. IoT now is taking and blowing this notion completely up. And it's allowing us to measure everything and manage anything. One application we're seeing is within manufacturing. So traditional manufacturing has relied on time-based maintenance schedules, right? Where you run for a certain amount of time to replace certain parts. And we see the exact same paradigm in, in the aviation industry. You know, we fly planes for so many hours, and then we replace these parts. And we don't look at what conditions were the planes flying in. We don't look at our historical data about what breaks and when. We just follow these strict rules. And IT has allowed us to totally turn that on its head. Instead of us saying when parts should be replaced, we are allowing the machine to tell us when those parts should be replaced. And this paradigm is something that originated within manufacturing, but is being taken and applied to, field, to, to completely different fields. So, bees, for example. Uh, bees are a trillion dollar problem. They're a trillion dollar problem because 30% of all agriculture in the world depends upon them for pollination. And yet we've seen a dramatic decrease in bee populations over the past century. In the United States, we've seen a two-thirds decrease in the amount of bees. So keeping bees healthy is absolutely critical to, to agriculture across the world. And it turns out that the health of a bee colony entirely depends upon whether or not you have a queen bee. And whether or not you have a queen bee is something that in the past has been incredibly difficult to figure out. So there's a very interesting technology that's being used now, which is measuring the temperature within a bee colony and is able to then predict when it is that you have lost that queen bee. So this is allowing people to replace that queen bee. So again, it's the exact same concept that we're seeing in predictive maintenance being applied into predictive agriculture. And you're seeing this trend in health as well, right? You heard a little bit about wearables in the last talk. It's this whole idea of can we use data to generate predictions to be proactive rather than sticking with our reactive paradigm. And speaking of paradigms, the second trend that we're seeing is a, is a fundamental movement in the paradigm of how we work with technology. So I would argue that the Industrial Revolution was really driven by the paradigm of humans driving machines, using machines to increase our physical capability to manipulate the world. The information revolution and the information age was characterized by a different paradigm. In this paradigm, we use machines to augment our mental capabilities. So you can think of this as, you know, in the first example, we're using a car to allow us to go further and faster. And in the second age, the age of information, we're using our GPS to tell us where to go. I think that we are entering a third age an age of automation, where machines are directing machines. And here's what I mean by that. This is a company, Xcel Energy, and they're a, they're a power company, and they are you know, used to set their wind turbine schedules by having humans look at wind patterns across their sites. And 
trying to figure out how to match peak energy demand with those wind cycles. They have fired all of the people that used to do that because now they rely on sensors that are embedded within those turbines to determine that schedule. You have these turbines telling other turbines when to turn on and when to turn off. And as a result, they've saved 40% of their operating costs. So this is an example of machines directing machines. And things get even more interesting when machines are creating machines. So this is an example of generative design, something Hobb talked a little bit about. Uh, and here, what you've done is you've fed into an algorithm a bunch of data you've collected from sensors inside of an engine. And you've told that algorithm, I want you to design the best you possibly can. And this is what that algorithm came up with. And this engine is 50% lighter than the human design alternative. And so this is a trend that I think we're going we're gonna to start seeing, that we're already seeing the beginning of, right? It's using AI not just to build better AI, but starting to make that movement from the digital realm and into the physical realm. Uh, and I want to present now a third example of machines directing machines uh, in this video. This is a story from the not too distant future. It's the day of your daughter Millie's big football match, and to be clear, that is the sort of football you play with your feet. Anyway, she is missing a vital piece of equipment. Specifically, a size 3 even though the third ground soccer sheet, the left one, and some of it sadly is in the family's three-year-old bulldog, Stuart. So then what? Well, you could hear a poor thing, but what's the point? Because all we will hear is blah, 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 Stuart's blah, blah, blah. Much better to live like a rational human being. And to place an order with Amazon for a pair of pure Evo car third ground soccer sheets and have them delivered in 30 minutes, or less. And in a location not too far away, a miracle of modern technology is dispatched. It's an Amazon drone, and after rising vertically like a helicopter to nearly 400 feet, this amazing hybrid design assumes a horizontal orientation and becomes a streamlined and fast airplane. In time, there'll be a whole family of Amazon drones, different designs for different environments. This one can fly for 15 miles, and it knows what's happening around it. It uses sense and avoid technology to, well, sense and then avoid obstacles on the ground and in the air. Back at the house, you're getting a message on your tablet to say that the delivery is arriving, and it goes back to vertical mode and scans the landing area for potential hazards. This amazing innovation then lowers itself slowly to the ground, drops off the package, and flies straight back up to altitude. And so what I think is, is amazing is that did you see a single person in that entire process? Okay, you'll see a person who will pick up this package. Uh, but the idea is that you can go from literally pointing and clicking on your computer to having something delivered. This entire value chain can be automated. Uh, you know, the company JD.com, which is one of the largest goods suppliers in China, recently announced that they are now setting up factories that have four people in the factory. And so you know, this is the final example of, of that uh, machines directing machines. Um, this, this optimization that we start seeing as we take humans and remove them from being in the middle of the loop to instead being on that loop. The third trend that we're seeing is moving beyond optimization and to what I would call discovery at scale. So this is what happens when we think about the fact that sensors can go places very easily that it's very, very difficult for humans to go. And one of those places is space. We've seen recently an absolute transformation of the commercial space industry. So a decade ago, it cost half a billion dollars to launch a satellite, to build and launch a satellite. And not only that, but it took 10 years to build that satellite. And so as a result, that satellite, when it was being sent up, had technology on it that was 10 years old. So an interesting fact is the Mars rover, which was a multi-billion dollar project, when the Mars rover was sent up, the camera on that Mars rover was only two megapixels. 
Apple had just introduced a 12 megapixel camera that you could buy on your iPhone. Okay? And the problem there wasn't that NASA is stupid. The problem was that NASA was locked into these very, very long development cycles. This is being completely disrupted by small satellites and nano satellites, which can be built and launched for under $50,000. And what we're seeing as a consequence is a huge increase in the number of these satellites that can be launched. So again, we're seeing a rise from 20 of these small satellites in 2010 to 250 in 2017, that number doubling a few years later. And the, the consequence of having all of these satellites is that we have a proliferation in new forms of data. So this is a company uh, called Cape Analytics. And Cape Analytics works within the insurance space. So when you buy a home uh, in the United States, and I imagine in Italy as well, you typically need to buy an insurance policy for your home. And in certain places in the world, the roof that you have on your home is going to cause that insurance policy to be 20% more or less expensive. So this is particularly true in a place like Florida in the United States that has hurricanes all the time. Uh, not only that, but the quality of your roof um, is also going to have an effect on the price. And so the whole paradigm has been we send a person out and that person will manually inspect your roof and then give an estimate which gets used to base the insurance on. The problem with that is that it's costly to send somebody out and you only get that one data point. So 20 years later, when that you know, roof may have undergone a huge amount of damage, you have no way of assessing. This company is able to tell both what roofs are made out of and the quality of that roofing for an entire state within two hours of analyzing satellite imagery. And this information is being used to determine new and updated insurance premiums. Here's another company. Uh, <coughs> this is Orbital Insights, which you heard a little bit about before. They're using their technology not just to count cars in parking lots, but then to use that information to actually predict stock prices. <coughs> in the case of J.C. Penney, which is a struggling American retailer, they were able to predict in advance what the stock price would be based on the cars that were in the lots. You heard a little bit uh, of, <coughs> excuse me, this is a company called Descartes Labs, and Descartes Labs is using their technology to do agricultural forecasting. So they look and they're able to detect how much water is within the soil, as well as what the crop density is, uh, and they're using this to predict corn yields within the United States. Uh, they are able to create a very high county level map. So the United States Department of Agriculture are also always trying to predict what the corn yields are. And they're doing this on a state by state basis, whereas this company is able to do it on a county by county basis. So it's not only able to go more precise, it's also giving better estimates. And what I think is so remarkable about this is the fact that you have a company, in this case it was a company at the time of 20 people, who are able to produce better predictions than a department of agriculture which has a multi-billion dollar budget. This speaks to a final trend, which is the democratization of disruption. You are seeing IoT enable players and actors to access technologies and to access capabilities in a way that they never could before, and at a cost or conceivable. So here's a group called the Rainforest Connection. And what they're trying to do is combat deforestation. And the way they're doing this is by taking used cell phones that have all those incredible sensors that we talked about and placing them within a rainforest. And those cell phones connect to a local network and are able to monitor the sounds that they hear. And they've built an algorithm that can detect whenever a chainsaw is heard so they can deploy immediately and stop illegal logging in its tracks. And what I think is so cool about this is that you're taking what could potentially be an environmental disaster, electronic waste, and converting it into a completely innovative solution. And you're doing this at almost no cost. This is a company called Pilot AI. And what they've done is they have taken and built algorithms that are able to use the cameras that are on board drones that you can buy on Amazon for $500. And rather than putting new hardware onto that drone, they have written algorithms that are capable of identifying people and tracking those people in real time. 
And this technology is allowing people to deploy drones that they can buy very, very cheaply all over the world. <clears throat> so here's an example of that technology in action. This is a, a drone that's being used to identify in real time whether that is a crop that it's seeing or a weed that it's seeing. And what's so amazing is that the alternative to this would have been an airplane. And it costs around $1,000 an hour to hire an airplane to fly over a field. The drone that is doing this costs $500 to buy. So you are, as a result, seeing access to these technologies, not just within the developed and Western world, but within the developing world. And this, I think, is one of the most exciting things that IoT promises, the fact that it is democratizing disruption, but it is also one of the most challenging aspects of IoT. This is footage that comes from Iraq. ISIS, the terrorist group, has also realized that they can use drones for disruption. And what they've done is they have taken a drone and they have mounted it with a grenade launcher, and now they are capable of using a $500 drone to destroy a $5 million Humvee. And, you know, one of our allies recently shot down one of these drones because that was the only thing that they could think of to, to try to combat this, uh, you know, combat this technology. They used a $3.5 million Patriot missile to destroy a $500 drone. That's the kind of disruption that this technology is enabling. <clears throat> this is a photo of the former president of Iran at a nuclear enrichment facility in Nantes. Who here has heard of Stuxnet? Okay, so Stuxnet was a computer virus. But it wasn't like most computer viruses. What made Stuxnet different was that it had the capability to go from bytes to bits. <coughs> what it did is it infected the software that controlled these enrichment tubes and caused them to accelerate their spinning until it destroyed that entire enrichment facility back in 2009. We're also seeing attacks like this at a much bigger scale. So last year, there was an attack on the Ukrainian power grid, which is now connected. And 80% of the Ukrainian power grid was taken offline for 16 hours. IoT can also be abused. Um, it can be abused in authoritarian countries. So China uh, recently launched a program called Skynet. Uh, and if any of you are Terminator fans, uh, the irony should be apparent. Um, and this program is using a combination of computer vision and all of the video cameras that they have to monitor people. And some of that monitoring is you know, fairly benign. It's giving tickets to jaywalkers. But some of that monitoring is very sinister. And we've seen an especially high usage of this technology in areas where there are ethnic minorities. This is a, a study, a, a piece of research that came out, which showed that you can connect the brain in real time to the internet. You can stream, using an EEG, your brain waves in real time online. Which you know, it was a pretty cool thing to be able to do. The researcher who developed this was contacted just a few weeks after he published this by a bunch of call centers. And what these call centers wanted to know is can we use that technology to monitor how much our employees are paying attention when they're on phone calls? So you can imagine businesses that are giving bonuses or firing people based on their brainwaves. IoT has new vulnerabilities as well. So right after Apple introduced their face unlock feature, a group in Malaysia published research showing how for $100 you could create a mask, and that mask could unlock any phone. And you know, in this case, it's pretty obvious what that mask is doing, right? It's recreating certain parts of the face that the phone uses to recognize. But we're also seeing much more sophisticated and troubling applications of what I call machine deception. So in this image, 
you have a panel of researchers, and the glasses that they are wearing are causing the algorithm to recognize them as the photo below. So to you and I, there's nothing going on here, right, other than the fact that they're wearing these funky looking glasses. But to that computer vision algorithm, which otherwise functions flawlessly, it's completely confused. And this is something that is very, very important and very, very overlooked in artificial intelligence, which is that we build these systems, and these systems may be incredibly competent at certain tasks, right? They may be able to recognize images far better than a human could, or they may be able to figure out when a part's going to break far better than a trained mechanic. But they have competence, but no comprehension. They fundamentally do not understand what it is that they are doing. And examples like this highlight that. Here's an even more troubling example. So here, researchers have taken tape, and they put that tape onto a stop sign. And that stop sign has caused the computer vision algorithm in a self-driving car to think that that stop sign is a 60 mile per hour speed sign. So you have pieces of tape that are able to confuse a state-of-the-art algorithm. This is a mistake that humans would never make, right? And this, I think, highlights the Faustian bargain that we're making. We have these technologies that are capable of dealing with our highly complex worlds, but those technologies are themselves highly complex, and in some cases may be fundamentally incomprehensible. So what is it that we're willing to give up? What kind of control are we willing to hand over to systems that we may fundamentally not understand? And I think that this raises my final point, which is that these technologies are taking us into new and uncharted waters, right? And in these new uncharted waters, we must rely on our moral compass as our guide. So a quote that I love, which comes from a mathematician named Norbert Wiener, who was uh, the inventor of the field of cybernetics and information theory, he says, there's one quality more important than know-how, and this is know-how by which we determine not only how to accomplish our purposes, but what our purposes are to be. And so I pose this to you. you know, the technologies that I've discussed today, these are technologies that could be technologies of liberation, and these are technologies that could be technologies of oppression. And the choice of what they become is something that we all need to consider. So thank you so much. Right, uh, um, thank you. Um, we're going to give people five minutes just to reflect on their own or, or within the team. But before they do that, my, my one question to you is, how, how do you ground, so, so that, that's great to say, and, and of course it's, it's, it's absolutely the right answer from a societal level is how do we use this, but here we've got you know, 100 individuals in their businesses trying to grapple with change and how they, how they perceive it and how they, how they relate to it and how they work with it. How, how do you take what you're saying into the sort of granular level of what are the sort of questions people should be asking? How should they be thinking about the Internet of Things in relationship to their everyday practice? And then we'll get on five minutes, then we'll come back for four more questions. <coughs> my, my other talk, which is my, my ethics talk, which I'll have to schedule one next time. Yeah. Uh, Give us a one minute version. <coughs> one minute version. Uh, so, there are frameworks and ways of, of approaching. Uh, ethical dilemmas, right? And I think the, the first thing to do is to not be fixated on, on the past and to try to not be merely fixated on the near term, but to try to look at the long term. Um, I think that's what Singularity University is at its core trying to emphasize, is that we can't just look at the near term and we can't just look at the past as our only source of instruction. We need to use our imagination as well, and engage in this creative reasoning, which I think we're going to do tomorrow. Um, but you know, so what I would say is that as a group, like that's what you need to do when you're thinking through these technologies: is not merely look at you know the analogies that that exist in the past, but also try to adopt structures that allow you to conceive things that that never have happened and that are disanalogous. Same. Okay. Thanks, guys. So uh, what we'll do is give you five minutes again, and um, if you want to write a question, there's any thoughts, questions, insights. If you fancy a, a group just chatting uh, within the group and sharing insights, 
uh, do that. Um, and then we'll bring Bryce uh, back on stage in five minutes and grill him on both sides. So um, we've got five minutes. Thank you.